So my goal um, throughout this sermon series has been to really help us ponder what it looks like to really follow Jesus in this time and this age. And really what I wanted to do is not just come up with new things, but really look through scripture of, of what are the things that he did. Remember the, the, first sermon, the first part of this series where I was talking about the importance of following Jesus, that we talked about what it meant to follow him as a rabbi back in those days? And that's what I'm trying to get us to understand, that what does it look like to follow Jesus in our lives, in our personal lives, what does that look like? Now, recently, I was asked by a pastor friend of mine what I thought was the greatest danger to our spiritual lives. What was the greatest danger to our spiritual lives? And even as I state that, many of you probably have several different answers. You probably have things that you're thinking of that you think, man, if this doesn't get corrected, this could be one of the greatest dangers to our spiritual lives. And as he asked that, it kind of perplexed me because I didn't quite know what to say. There's a lot of things that would be applicable to that, that you could say and, and you could go, yeah, that, that would be it. But when I started really thinking about it, Especially as a pastor who sees people come and go, people that, uh, that are struggling even in their spirituality, and sometimes they wonder why. They may ask, I don't feel God the way that I used to. Uh, why is that? And as a pastor, I, I started realizing that sometimes one of the, the greatest habits that follows individuals that are struggling greatly with their spiritual development is none other than this vice. You ready for it? Busyness. 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 One of the greatest enemies to our spiritual development that I believe happens to us all is busyness. And in American culture, we have idolized busyness to unparalleled heights. We have been taught to even wear our business as a badge of honor. All you have to do to see this played out in any area of anybody's life is just to ask someone, how are you doing today? And you know what they'll normally say? I'm doing fine, just busy. We all, that is the first thing every single person will say to you. I'm doing fine, just, I'm just busy. I'm just really busy. And, and just in that statement, I want you to think about this. Just in that statement, it reveals so much about us, doesn't it? I'm okay. I'm just busy. And I feel like that statement doesn't mean the same thing that it even used to mean 15 to 20 years ago. Now, we have hijacked that statement that when we say, I'm fine, I'm just busy busy. What we actually mean today in some regards, and not totally, but in a lot of ways, is I'm important. I'm so busy because I'm so important. I'm, I'm cool. People want me around. They schedule time with me. People are into me. You know because I'm busy. I'm just so busy. And we sometimes, here's the thing that I realized, we sometimes say this even when we are not busy at all, simply because it sounds so much better than saying I have nothing to do, right? We'll say it even when we're not busy because we are afraid that someone will think you're lazy. You don't have anything going on because you will never, ever, ever hear someone say when they're asked, hey, how you doing? You know what? I'm doing okay. I'm just extremely bored right now. You know why? Because the first thing's going to be is like, well, let me find you something to do. You know what? None of you, when, you, when I would ask you, hey, how are you doing today? None of you are going to go, you know what, Pastor? I'm doing awesome today. I slept till 2 p.m. today. I have been in my pajamas all day long. I just needed a me day. And I feel so much better about it. Nobody's ever going to say that, even if it's true. Why? Because we have idolized business to the point to where even if someone would take a day 
off. It's looked at as a bad thing. It's looked at as a bad thing. We are so busy. If you think about yourself in your life, think about this. You are busy with work. You are busy with your own social group. You are busy with your family and all the activities that come with that. You are busy with your kids and all the activities from school and sports and and programs and everything else. Uh, We're even busy with church and keeping up with the status quo of being there every single time the doors open as a pastor. I love it, but sometimes I do wonder if we just do things to do things, not because they are life-giving things. And what happens when we are so busy and we don't realize our own business is that we have packed our calendars with every little thing going 90 miles per hour trying to keep up with everything and everyone because we don't want to let anybody down. We fear letting someone down. So we keep up with the charade to appear that we're always busy. We're not overloaded. It's okay. I got this. It's all right. What many of us don't realize is that by doing this, we are causing great damage to ourselves at a very deep soul level. We are damaging ourselves at a very deep soul letter. And philosopher and theologian Dallas Willard agrees with me when he says this, that busy is the greatest enemy of spiritual life. Busy. Think about it right now. You are in the house of God to worship God, but you are so busy that you're thinking about something else instead of what God is trying to teach you here right now. We've got to do so much. We've got so much to do. You've got to get dinner ready. You've got to take your medication. You've got to get the kids here and there and everywhere else that you aren't even here. What many of us don't realize is that there is a business that goes beyond just our schedule and into our inner being. And I want you to think about something as we talk about this, that when this happens, it's why we are so restless. It's why we are so unhappy, even though we have everything we want. It's why we don't have any peace in our lives. It's also why many of us live with a constant passenger of fear in our lives. We are going at an unheralded pace and we can't keep up. We are burning both ends of the candle without knowing the long-term effects that living this way brings us. And the question that we all have in this world and in this time is, all right, that's fine, I get it, I know what you're saying, but what do I do? What do I do about this? What do I do about this craziness? How do I change this? It got me thinking about the ancient Jewish practice of Sabbath. Sabbath. I know. Crazy. Sabbath. Because remember, we're talking about practicing the way of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus practiced the Sabbath? Jesus practiced the Sabbath. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, I'm doing that already. I'm here. No, you're not. Just because you're here in a building listening to Jesus, about Jesus, doesn't mean you're practicing Sabbath. Oh, it's hush. When most of us think about the word Sabbath, we typically think of just going to church on a Sunday. And let me preface it by saying, I do think it's important to be in church. How many of you think it's important to be in church? I think that it helps us. I think that it can become something that is life-giving. It should become something that's life-giving. I think it's there. But I also understand that in the original idea of Sabbath, it's so much more than just coming to church because it's something that maybe your parents drag you to or maybe has become a habit in your own life. This practice was established, believe it or not, in Genesis chapter 1 when God was creating the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything that we see. 
And after God created everything he made, he said this. He said that it was good. And so what we have is we have a God who in six days created everything. He created everything. And then on the seventh day, Scripture tells us in Genesis 1 that he blessed that day. He makes that day holy. And then he himself rested. I want you to grab a hold of this truth today, that simple truth that sometimes we overlook, that God himself rested. God himself rested. Now, in Hebrew, the word rested is Shabbat. Shabbat. And it is where we get the word Sabbath from. And you know what it means? It means to stop. To just stop. It means to cease. It means to be done. To just stop to cease, to be done with what you normally do on the other six days. Now, this does not mean that God was tired from his work. No, that's not what it's trying to show us. This is not what the author of Genesis is trying to convey. No, no. You see, the author of Genesis is trying to show a rhythm to enjoyment of this thing that we have and that all of us have that is so precious but yet so fragile and it's called life. He's trying to get us to stop. He's trying to get us to cease. He's trying to get us to enjoy. It has this picture of Sitting down on your front porch after a long, hard day of work. You're looking out over all that you've done with maybe a nice cold lemonade in your hand and watching the sun go down. And you're looking out over everything and you feel completely fulfilled. You say to yourself, this was good. This was good. It's being able to stop for a second. And no, this is, this is good. It's a snapshot in time. It's a moment that you'll go back to and remember. It's memories that you have that you continue to bring up that you know that even as bad as it gets, I have these moments that I can stop and say it's good. It's still good. God is still good. You see, it is the ability to stop, which so many of us honestly never do. It's like a lost pastime of sorts, and it's probably something you would never consider with a word like Sabbath. But the truth is, when we hear that word Sabbath, it just doesn't stop with just rest. Another way to translate that word is to celebrate to celebrate. So if we took those two ideas and we placed them together, what we would have on our Sabbath is when we are here, we are stopping to celebrate. Is that why you're here today? To stop to celebrate? Do you know sometimes it's hard? It almost has to become a habit to stop and celebrate because you have so many reasons to complain. You have so many reasons to be mad. You have so many reasons to be angry. You have so many reasons to be disappointed that sometimes in your mind you need to know that Sabbath is coming so it can remind you that when I get there, I'm going to stop and I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to look over what God has been doing in my life and I'm going to praise Him for it. Because it is life-giving. It is life-giving. Is that what comes to mind for you when you think of Sabbath? Is that what we have done here today? Is that we have stopped to celebrate the victories that we didn't think we had? Have we come to stop to celebrate who God is in our lives? Have we come to stop to celebrate to say, it is good? Now, 
when you look at Genesis chapter 1, you see that God blesses animals. He blesses humans. He tells them, be fruitful and multiply. But then we see him bless, ironically, just a day. Do you notice that? He blesses the Sabbath. He blesses a day. It is as if God created this day because he knew that we would need a day that could give us life. Because the other six days sure do take life, don't they? They, they, they zap us of our strength. They zap us of our peace. We have things every single day that happen in our lives that take life away with us. Those other six days come with issues and they come with drama. They are filled with tough decision. They are filled with loss. But even in those days, there are moments to where it's absolutely beautiful. The kind that keep you going, the kind that we need, and whether we realize it or not, we all need a day to our soul, and when I talk about our soul, our mind, our will, here's a big one, our emotions. How are you doing emotionally today? How are you doing at a soul level today? We need a day. God knows that we need a day to where our soul can catch up to the frantic pace of our bodies. Do you understand that you need that here this morning? It's a day to catch our breath. It's a day to inhale and exhale. And the most incredible thing that I realized about this seventh day that God created is that it is the first time in Scripture that the word holy is used. The first time in Scripture that the word holy is used, and it is used to refer to a day. Do you know what holy means? Set apart. It is to be set apart. And it is used to describe a time, one set apart from the others. It is an invitation from God to stop and come near to him. Is that what we've done? And it seems so logically easy, doesn't it? That we need this day, that we need to observe this day, that we need to stop, that we need a day like that, right? How many of us understand logically that that makes sense. I would say all of us, but I would also say it's also one of the main reasons so many of us struggle in our soul is because we just find difficulty doing it. It is so hard to just stop. We just stop and allow our soul to catch up with our body. Because when we don't, what happens is that we get off rhythm. We get off rhythm. And when we are off with rhythm, we throw everything else off. When you don't stop and go before God, when you don't stop and celebrate this, even the small things in your life that God has done, you lose focus of who is bringing you through. And when that happens, when your soul becomes withered and tired because you have not learned the practice of Sabbath, what happens, and I want you to think about this, is this you here this morning? We become emotionally unhealthy. Our emotions rule us. They rule us. You become fatigued. How many of you are tired here this morning? And it goes down deep to the soul of how tired you are. You are exhausted. You are stressed. How many of you there? (laughs) You're stressed. And when that happens, our immune system is run down. We are easily angered at anything that goes wrong. And something in our spirit just feels off. We feel empty. We feel hollow. We feel disconnected from both God and from people. They are telltale signs that our our soul is just screaming for a Sabbath. We need rest. We need God. We need to celebrate. We need to remember. We need to be in the moment. Because when we don't, it is detrimental to our souls. 
In Exodus 16, there is this account of the Israelites that have been complaining that they were not getting what they needed from God, mainly food, in Exodus 16. You see, for these Israelites, it has been two months since God has miraculously delivered them from the hands of Egyptian slavery. They had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt, and God, by his miraculous hand, has brought them out. But they find themselves in a problem. They find themselves in a wilderness, in a desert, with no food, no drink, just Nothing but God. Nothing but God. And so they do what all of us would do when things aren't going well. They complain. It's the same thing. It's a, it's a national pastime for us humans. That when God isn't showing up the way that we think, we complain. We get upset. We don't understand. So in verse 3, they say this, that if only we had died By the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Can you believe this? Yeah, you can. Because we do it too. We do it too. If only... You see, what ends up happening when your soul is withering is that you begin to look at things a lot differently. And that's what's happening for them. For two months, they have been traveling through a desert. Nothing grows in the desert. Nothing lives really in the desert. You're not going to find anything of source and substance in the desert. And what they really see here is that their souls are wrecked. They are spent. You see, they even get to the point to where they are exaggerating what used to be because they undervalue what they are now experiencing. That's what's happening. It is what a withered soul will do to any circumstance that God brings them through. They miss God in the momentary discomforts, and it happens in your life too. That when things are going wrong, you can miss God in the mundane. You can miss God in the temporary discomforts because you elevate those things larger than you elevate your God to those things. He didn't bring you here. He didn't bring you in the desert to starve you to death. No, he brought you to the desert to learn to live, that you can learn to live even while you find yourself in the desert because your source can't be found in other things. Your source has to be found in the one that gives you life and provides for you even when you don't see a way that it can happen because life is full of desert journeys, friends. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. This journey of life is full of desert moments to where God is going to reveal something to you that he wouldn't in the mountaintops, I'm here to tell you. And if your soul is damaged, it'll always misrepresent what God is doing. And you can abort the process. Because you misunderstand or misread what God is doing. You see, an important lesson for all of you here today for Sabbath is that he didn't bring you here to die. He brought you here to learn a very valuable lesson that he is the total source of your supply. And if you try to find your supply in any other thing, you are worshiping not the God that brings you freedom, but the God that will eventually enslave you. They were worshiping what used to be in Egypt without realizing that they were slaves in Egypt. But God has brought them to freedom, and they're complaining about freedom. Sometimes we do the same thing. And in four of this, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, After hearing their complaints, because God is a gracious God, he can take your complaints. That's the awesome thing about God. But he says, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they follow my instructions. And then in five, it says, on the sixth day, get this, on the sixth day, 
They are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other day. So they could, they could gather any food that God brings down for six days, and on the sixth day, they were to get double the amount so they could have a Sabbath on the seventh day. God is going to meet their need. They were to bring it in. Why? Because they were to take a Sabbath rest. In 6 it says, So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Because they had already forgotten it. It had only been two months. And before we judge them too harshly, for some of us it's been one day. And we have forgotten what God has brought us out of. And he says, and in the morning in seven, you will see the glory of God. And I want you to hear this because he has heard your grumbling against him. I want you to think about the depth of that statement. That I heard what you said about me. And I'm going to prove it wrong. God doesn't have to prove anything. But it shows the depths that he's willing to go to get you and get your attention. That I want you to know, even though you're grumbling, and even though it's un, unimaginable that you would even grumble about me delivering you in the way that I did, when you think about what he'd done to Egypt, that we're two months in and you were already, already questioning who I am, that's okay. I'll show you again. I'll show you again. And so it says that they are going to see the glory of God in this way, in the morning. And so for six days, they would see the glory of God as he would miraculously provide food in a place to where there was no food. He was trying to show them that he was their source, even in the desert, because you will find yourself in the desert. The problem is, where is your source in the desert? That'll determine whether you make it out alive or not. And until they understand this, they will always be a slave to their circumstance. Listen to me. Some of you have gotten to the point to where you are a slave to your circumstance. Anything that goes wrong, your whole world is turned upside down. You even lose some trust in what God has told you or what he's brought you out of because you are so moved by what happens around you. Your emotions go haywire because of what has happened around you. You are moved just like the wind. The wind moves you around because of what happens. You are a slave to your circumstance. And the true test of a soul that is permeated by God, that is, that is infiltrated by God and held by God is one that even though the circumstance happens, it doesn't mean you won't be sad. It doesn't mean you won't be angry. It doesn't mean that you won't have bad days. But what it means is that you can stand firm on the word of God saying, I may not be the way that I want, but I know that he is my source and he will bring me through. You see, all they had to do was to prepare if we wanted to use the word work for six days and rest on the Sabbath, sounds like a pretty sweet deal to me. I mean, they didn't even have to prepare the food. They weren't cooking it. God was bringing it miraculously. The only thing they had to do was grab a bag and throw it in there and then rest on the Sabbath. How many of you would love to have meals like that? I mean, I love fast food, but there's nothing like God fast food, right? That's amazing. It's all they had to do. And that Sabbath, the reason why God wanted it to be there, wanted him to observe it, is found in verse 23 when it says that it was to be a holy Sabbath unto God. It was supposed to be something that they stopped as dedication to God. It was to be a holy Sabbath unto God. It was meant to be set apart for the Lord. And it seems that the reason that God wanted to do this is because he wanted them to know and found in verse 12 that I am the Lord your God. What this shows me is that Sabbath isn't just about rest. It's part of it. But it is also about worship. 
It is also about worship. And you can easily forget while you're here today that you're not here to just see friends. You're not here just to hear a message. You're not here to be emotionally moved or experience goosebumps. You are here to worship. So can you find rest and can you find worship? Is that what we are doing here today? Because if it's not, maybe we need to rethink some things, right? Rest will help you. But I want you to get this, but worship will heal you. Rest will help you. But I have found in my life that worship will heal you. Is it possible to be here today resting but not worshiping? Yeah, it can be. It is, it is one of the greatest dangers to our soul that we easily forget, even in this setting, who it is that we are here for, who it is that we're worshiping, who it is that he says that he is. That you made it to today simply because he provided for you when you were in the desert moments. And maybe the reason why even after rest our soul, our soul is still spent is because we didn't go to the source of God who replenishes our soul even today. You know one of the greatest tragedies is to leave here, which is supposed to be a day, a moment of rest and worship to where you feel refueled, re-energized, refocused, and you leave here and get none of it. And I often wonder, why is that? Is it, is it my fault? Maybe sometimes. Maybe even just like you, I get into the flesh too many times. Is it God's fault? No, never. <laughs> is it your fault? Yeah. Because so many times... We allow the cares and the worries and the anxieties of this world to pull us out of stopping. You know what some of you have a problem with, and it's the same thing that I have a problem with, and God was dealing with me when I was hearing this, is that I have a savior complex. I need to fix everything. I need to control everything. I need to, when I see something wrong, I've got to fix it. If I don't fix it, who's going to fix it? <laughs> How stupid as if I can control anything. You know what we need to learn to do is that on the Sabbath, there is moments to where I come in with all the broken things that I can't fix and stop trying to fix them and say, God, I can't do this anymore. Take it from me. Do something and change it because you're the only one that can do something with this. Remember when I was sitting up here and I'm holding these prayer requests? There's a natural side of me like, I don't know, we need to do something about this. There's another side of it to where, <laughs> unless you are all powerful, <laughs> I can't do anything. And there's moments to where God will put you in those desert moments. So that way you can understand that how limited you are and how much you need him. Over the years, I have had several people ask me if we are still commanded to observe the Sabbath. Especially in the fulfillment of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, what does that mean for Sabbath? And to be honest with you, I'm always careful to answer this because while I don't believe it's some legalistic rule that you have to follow and if you miss a day, you're going to hell automatically, I do believe that it is beneficial practice that every follower of Jesus should practice in some form. My fear, though, is that people would take the idea that it is not a command and just do away with it altogether. And the reason I say that is because I have pretty much seen that happen in a lot of people's lives. It's almost happened recently to some degree. When the pandemic happened, we have seen more and more people just like, I'm not going at all. And there's parts of it to where I understand for one thing, but there's another thing to where some individuals have almost used it as an excuse just to do away with it altogether. The truth is that the Sabbath, if you really want to look at it, predates the Torah, it predates the law, because the Sabbath was actually introduced in Genesis before Moses would make it and God would give him the Ten Commandments. And while I don't know if it is a sin if you don't practice Sabbath, I could say that it's foolish if you don't. Just like I could say, you know, 
You could sleep for three hours a night if you wanted to. It's not a sin. There's no command against it, but I would say this, that you are foolish if you do. Your body will feel the effects of just trying to sleep three hours a night. And as someone that has done that, I can tell you from personal experience, it's not a sin, but it's foolish to do it. You see, what I wonder is, instead of looking at it as a legalistic thing that you have to do, what if we started looking at Sabbath? What if we embrace Sabbath as maybe what it was originally intended to be, is a gift, is a gift. Something that is a gift from God that was created for us, for you, for me. Because God knew how easy it would be to overload and overwork ourselves every single day and how easy it is to creep into saying, you know what, I'm so busy, the only day I can finish this is on a, how's it go? Yeah. We don't have to do it, we choose to do it. And then what ends up happening is the rest of your week is kind of off because you're going 90 miles an hour and you bypass the stop sign. You see, he knew how damaged our souls could become because of the other six days. How easy it is and how hard it is. Those six days are hard. You get news. This past week, I, I found out that someone that was very dear to our family I mean, his daughter was in the delivery room with Rachel and I because her mother was out doing mission work. He was on my board. We spent hours in warfare and combat praying for each other. He was a gentle giant. He would, he would buy little, little onesie jumpsuit type things for Gavin when he was first born. Just had a way about him. He passed away due to COVID. And heard that news. And I've been in a funk all week, not knowing whether to cry or to celebrate. Because sometimes life hits you like that. And I just need this day to stop. Because the rest of the day, man, it brings its own pain, doesn't it? it? Brings its own issues, brings its own worries. But today, I just need to remember who God is. Today, I just remember what he's promised, that there'll be a, a day after all that is gone. I sometimes wonder and ponder if that's actually what's happening in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve fell and God finds them hiding from him. And God asks them a simple question of where are you? It says in there that he was going to meet with him in the cool breeze of the day, and I've always kind of wondered, is that what Sabbath is, meeting, stopping to meet with God? It's sort of like this question of why didn't you stop to see me? Why did you think that you would find your source in anything other than me? Did you forget that I was the Lord your God? Where are you? Where is your soul in this moment, which then makes Jesus' miracle of the man with the withered hand even more powerful when you think about this? Just stretch out your hands. Stretch out your hand because Jesus, do you understand? Most of Jesus' miracles were done on the Sabbath. When miracles were not supposed to be done, Jesus goes against the religious rules of the day to let you know that God still brings healing on the Sabbath. Stretch out your hand because I see where you are. Adam would not stretch out his hand to God, but a man with a withered hand could see who Jesus is and in his discomfort be bold and courageous enough to say, no, 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 I'm not leaving here unchanged. I see where you are. I see the condition of your soul. You need to stretch out your hand because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You see, our rest is found in what he's done. He is our Sabbath. 
It's why Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, in your English it says rest, but it's actually Sabbath. Come to me and I will give you Sabbath. You can stop. You can rest. You can celebrate. You can look over what I've been doing in your life and you can say, it's good. It's good. Because what if Sabbath was a shadow of who would bring ultimate rest? And in John 10.10 it says this, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says this about himself, but I, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. The truth is, there are a lot of people that are living, but they are not alive. There are a lot of people living, but they are not alive. Pastor Daniel, if you're here, can I have you come as we get ready to close out? The thief comes only to steal, and I want you to think about that. Because for six days, he'll do that, won't he? He will steal, he will kill, and he will destroy. And he's going to do it all of your lives. But on that seventh day, on that Sabbath, you can enter into a rest that only he can provide. And as I was thinking about what I kind of wanted to say as we close this out, I, I thought about something that I typically do on our videos when we do the living room sessions. A lot of times it's what the rabbis would kind of say is sort of this thing of, so may you, after hearing the message, to apply it. And so, today, may you come. May you come with your tattered and torn soul. May you come with all your fear and all your anxiety. May you come with all your failure and all your shame. May you come with everything that you have that's weighing you down to the one and the only one who can actually give you Sabbath. And not just Sabbath, but life. May you stop. May you breathe in and breathe out. May you be here soul find rest and as you're doing that may you enjoy may you celebrate may you worship that he is the Lord your God that no matter how bad the past six days were that you made it through he has been the source of your supply it's why you're here in this moment that you can look at it that you can raise your hands that you can be in solidarity that your soul can find quietness that you are allowing this moment for your soul to catch up with your body that you can sit there and look over the week as the sun goes down and say it was good He's still good. Even when you hear news of someone that you love passing away, you can know the promise of God that says, He heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. And even though it hurts, I'm here today. Because He's brought me through. May your soul find rest. May today we recapture the beauty and the mystery of this day, Sabbath, of rest, of stopping, to celebrate.